Hi, it's Paul Bain. It's greatdad.com, and we're here for another in our series of Great Dad Talks, and I'm really excited to talk to Jonathan Harris today. Uh, Jonathan has got a, a website and has been working on a project that is probably going to be something very interesting to a lot of fathers out there. Uh, the, the website itself is called parenttheirpassion.com, and it's about how to, how to, uh, how to uh, get kids with uh, identify their passions and, and help that turn into into skills that they can actually use later on in the marketplace. So welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's, this is something like I, I say that's very interesting to me because I, I face these same challenges that it p- appears that you overcame. Uh, I think a lot of a lot of dads, you know, whether whether they have a home business, and they're trying to get their kids to work and get a tax deduction out of it, or or they see their kids like moving in one direction, they want to make sure they got some marketable skills. They try to, you know, you try to like send your kids to do internships, or or in my case, you know, I have this website called GreatDad.com. I own Pregnancy Magazine. I had all this internet stuff, and I wanted to get my kids doing work on that. And thought that would be, you know, great great skills they could do. Have an internship with their dad. What you know, everybody wins. But it turned out to be that it was a little bit more challenging than I thought to uh, stimulate them to want to work for me, even though I thought the skills that they could have gained were really valuable. So this is interesting to me uh, personally. So tell me how you got into it, because you got you got nine kids at all yes. different age ranges and you you, uh, you you really developed this to help them out. Yeah. And so. Right. Just to give a, a perspective here. So right now we have uh, out of the home, we have, I have five older kids out of the home. My oldest is 24 and then subsequent years down. Actually in there, I got a set of twins. So I, I cheated a little bit there <laughs> to, to pack them in. And then now I have in the house still a 16 year old on down to a six year old. And I'm still using the the same method. And when this kind of came about, when I don't know, it was around 40, you know, which is typical age when guys really start thinking about what kind of career they've been in for so long. And you got to make those hard decisions. Do you keep climbing the, the, in that case, I was in the corporate world, the corporate ladder. And, and of course, just like a lot of my colleagues and coworkers, you know, you reevaluate where you are, why you are. And at the end of the day, a lot of times you are where you are, a lot of it by accident, which is okay to a certain extent, but also you wish you would have planned and thought this out a little bit more because once you go down a particular road, you know, you have certain certifications, certain experiences, and already you're limiting yourself uh, to, to a certain um, uh, financial outcome. So theoretically you could change career, but it becomes more complicated when you've got uh, kids that you love, of course, and a wife that you love, and you don't want to all start. But they keep on stuff. eating, they keep on consuming the groceries. Yeah. So I was starting to read like a lot of the self-help, amazing self-help books and great ideas and stuff. And as I was reading this and my son was, my oldest at that point was 12, I started thinking, well, wait a second, why should I repeat the same general educational path for my own children when I'm really not that crazy about the outcome? Now, to 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 be clear, I had a great childhood, to be honest. I, I went to a great school, went to uh, a, a very nice uh, boarding school in Europe in my high school year. So I don't, I, and, and not because I was a troubled kid, it was very nice. <laughs> and then I went to college, had a great college experience and everything. But when all is said and done, all that education didn't really make a difference in the marketplace. Mm. It felt like that. So I thought, well, I felt like I was almost overeducated. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people feel this way. You know, you're at your day to day jobs like I could have done this when I was in high school. <laughs> and, uh, and kind of all this stuff realizes that it's a lot of general knowledge, accumulated knowledge that's not focused around what you really want to do. And of course, part of the part of the, the puzzle, of course, is what is it you really want to do? You know, that that's a big philosophical question. Yeah. So I thought when my son was 12, uh, there was one particular moment. It's almost like a turning point for me when. Kindle was just starting to come in. And at that point, we'd go to the library and come back with oodles of books. And we love to read as a family. And so we were churning through the books really fast. And I told him my son hadn't read Sherlock Holmes, like, hey, you got to read Sherlock Holmes. And I had a work from home uh, position back in those days. And, uh, and I, as I went to go get my copy, so my son, hey, why don't you go online and reserve the books? We'll pick them all up. You'll love it. I come back and my son says, yeah, I got them all. It's like, great. Uh, we'll pick them up. It's like, no, dad, I have them all. And it took me a while to, I mean, I know you could download books, but this was the first, uh, the beginning almost of the uh, the ebook revolution, the digital revolution was really, really starting to come in. 
bottom line is he got all the books, read them all within a week or two, all of them. And, uh, and my son wasn't a, he wasn't a particularly literary person, but the point was he was educated enough to get the information, read the information in two weeks time, just blow through it. He obviously was reading it. And, and then I was thinking, well, I, I remember my days. Once you go through that, then you got to go up to the dark literature. And I'm like, well, this is, I mean, it wasn't just because he was reading Sherlock Holmes. My point was, is that we were burning through so much of the traditional bucket learning. It's like, what's the point? Now we're going to do stuff in college that really, frankly, I didn't really care for. Uh, I, I checked my, you know, went down the checklist to say I was educated. But as soon as you get out of that, you say, you know, I'll never take a course like that again. And I was feeling like we were just going to go do this, but at an earlier time. Hmm. Uh, and I was like, I, he doesn't need to read this stuff. I mean, what's what's the point? If I had had a choice, I would have written the college course differently. And it dawned on me, it's like, why can't I do that? Hmm. So it was combined with the fact is that I wanted my children to be able to understand much sooner their sort of their bent and their advantages to create uh, something they were passionate about. So one of the one of the things we ran into was writing essays. And this is a very it's a traditional learning, right? Whatever curriculum you have, it's going to go through various stages of, you know, write a persuasive essay, write a narrative, write it, whatever it is. I, I can't remember how many different methods we've had out there. And typically you're writing on a topic you really don't care about. Combined with the fact that the teacher has to read the same essay over and over, yeah, especially yeah. when they're young, there's nothing new. They're not advanced enough to bring anything new. Uh, no one's going to pay you to read it. So I thought, why not use the, the time that, that one spends to learn how to write, to actually write about the field of interest that they have a natural interest in. So we started changing all the school requirements. And of course we homeschooled, so we had that, that freedom to do that. So it, let's, let's say um, as an example, you're, you're coming across George Washington and you've got the proverbial wooden teeth that because it's safe to write about, it's accessible. You can't, you can't go off too much on a topic because they're not advanced. So everybody's writing the same essay, teacher is bored your parents will barely read it. Uh, you're certainly not going to share it with your buddy and it just gets tossed into the, into the trash. So there's very little effort put into it. You do the word count and as long as you're, <laughs> you know, you know how it is. Yeah, yeah. So I said, why don't, if you, yeah. let's say uh, you're interested in um, um, metal smithing, which is a typical teenage thing at that age, why don't you find out uh, what kind of metallurgy they did during the time of George Washington. And you write on that very narrow topic, but within that historical context. So the same thing too, if you're interested in dance or some kind of art, you know, uh, dance was a very big social way for people to connect, especially during that time more than it is now. Uh, how did the upper classes use it? What were they? What were the tunes? So as you're writing, through your English curriculum, you're actually building your portfolio, a deep portfolio of knowledge about a specific area of human endeavor that you might have an interest in. Mm -hmm. And so that's just one example of what we did. So as, you're, as your child is thinking and articulating his thoughts about it, in the beginning, very incoherent, uh, very difficult, very, uh, as they go, they, they, they become uh, jealous about the meaning of what they write. So they become more articulate. They're concerned that what they're saying makes sense. So a lot of times when they first start off, you as a parent, you might look at it and say, and we have them do it as a blog. So it's always visible publicly, though very few people read it, right? They're not famous, but there's a sense that other people might read it, which is very important. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when they first start off, uh, like our son, our 13 year old son right now is very much into 3D printers. He's going in deep, deep dive. And he, a, it, when he runs into a difficulty, I tell him, why don't you blog about the difficulty you're running into? Well, the act of him writing about it, even if he doesn't have success, the act of wrestling with the problem at hand is what creates the, the intelligence and the emotional attachment to what he's doing. So if I read it and I say, I don't, oh, is this, is this, is this because this and this burns? And he's like, no, dad. That's not what it, that's not what I meant. It's like, oh, well, I was a little confused here. And then they'll go back and then they'll correct it. So the emotional attachment to what they're writing becomes very important. So you don't have to worry about, are you, are you writing enough words 
No, sure. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it becomes right organic itself, when, when somebody's very, right. It becomes uh, organic. So this is what we did is we, we, we used uh, our environment, including our curriculum to serve an overall talent focus that our child might have. Yeah, that that really makes sense. Obviously, you've got the, the benefit if you have the luxury of being able to homeschool. Um, in the best of situations, teachers do try to do that. They give free form essays and they, you know, they try to get kids to write essays where the, the topic isn't defined. And they, you know, they I think teachers wrestle with this a lot between the ones right. who are lazy and just say, you know, do let's right. George Washington's teeth. And the other one who say, now I'm going to really throw it in the kids' hands and make them do all the work coming up with the topic. And they they realize there are real challenges to that too. So that so I think that it's it's interesting that you had you had that flexibility to do that. And then also as a homeschool parents, the the dedication and the you know the focus is makes that a challenge. So how how is there some lesson from that? I mean, other than the fact that get people to write what they're passionate about, which would be, you know, one of the yeah. first lessons of if you want to be a writer, but for the for the average parent to Yeah, well that that's only because that's really when I I, I just use that as an example because I think that's the one most people uh, uh, we have in common, whether you're at a public school, sure. private school, homeschool, uh, you you'll you'll run across some uh, learning tasks that you need to do. And, you, you know, you got to encourage your kid to try to write it. And typically, though, it's more random. Uh, even I would I'd almost disagree, though, because my experience is remembering I was both in public school and private school and in Europe. They all at the end of the day, uh, you really don't have that much freedom because you don't have that continuity really between uh, all your essays. So you could say so, by the way, so if you did have, uh, let's say, arbitrarily here, you had a child who's interested in, in uh, dance. And, and a lot of kids go through the phase and they abandon it and they come back and that's fine. There's, you know, it's a certain amount of social uh, um, uh, fun to it, but in terms of taking it to a, a passion level where a person could actually make a living on it uh, on their terms, you would actually have to start fairly young oh, to yeah. have, to have a chance because a lot of times what people happen is they'll start on something, but they don't have enough lift off in their skill set. So when they turn 18, 19 parents or kids say, I'm too scared. I can't make it on their own. So I'm just going to go get a traditional bachelor's education. I don't know what to do. And so, of course, they lose that momentum, right? Or, or they need to, to, to get a job because it doesn't, what they're interested in, they're not good enough to bring some money in. So that when you get into the practical aspect of it, um, that's the external component of not focusing uh, um, soon enough and in depth enough on whatever subject you have. And what we do there is that a lot of times we'll, we'll use a, a casual interest that a child will have. Now, these casual interests are not random. A lot, most of the time, people have interests that are somewhat suited to their natural, you know, whatever you want to call it, psychological bent, emotional bent. Uh, it's also partly related to your family's uh, in, environment. And so what you want to do is uh, uh, take an interest that they have. And it's really an excuse. You don't in uh, uh, playing video games, right? It's the bane of every parent. I bump into parents. Oh my goodness, my kid's talent is playing video games. Like, no, it's not. <laughs> you know, was he bringing value to other people with it? No, he's just serving himself. Okay, well, let's stop talking about talent here. He's just enjoying himself, and uh, it's a game and a leisure, like everything else is. And, uh, and so what I, we did, we actually had a child like this who's actually a full-time programmer, and that's how he started. He, was a, he had a very logical mind, and he fell into the Minecraft game, which is still very popular. Ten years ago, it was also popular, and we started cracking down on him in a positive way. And the dad's like, I know you've got it in you. I see this bent. I said, I would like to see you do some plugins for the Minecraft game. And plugins, uh, for those who aren't familiar, are just uh, Minecraft allows you to write these to write these enhancements to the game to this popular child's game, but you can write simple modifications and enhancements with, with it's barely coding. But once you get into that, you're starting to produce something for other people. So he started doing this, and he would have online friends, and he would have birthday parties, and he would do, do games inside this Minecraft environment that were not possible unless you wrote code for it. Yeah. So he started doing this and which we, because we understood our son and, and his natural interest, I said, if you want to keep playing these games, I want to watch, I'm going to, I want to see evidence that you're writing code for this. 
and uh, uh, and basically he couldn't do his hobbies. Just like just we treated it just like uh, you would for school. Or like if your child says, "Hey, I don't feel like doing math this this year," you don't say, "Well, it's not your natural bent." Uh, I, I guess that's okay. But a lot of times we treat people's when you see a child, your child who has a natural bent in a particular. Uh, uh, talent. It's not a talent yet, but it's like, boy, if this was 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 cultivated, it could really make a difference to them. Yeah. But a lot of times, it's like, okay, well, if you're not in a mood, don't do it. We don't give them that choice. I mean, we within reason, we say, you know what? You've told me you love this, but you're just not disciplined enough to pursue this. So, I, what I want you to do is, I want you to spend an hour to two hours today, and if you don't know the answer how to get started, that's the beginning of a blog post. I don't know. I, so he says, he might say, I don't know, 12 year old. I don't know how to code this. That's, you know what? Go online and find out. So and that's what he says. We have an interview with my son and he talks about this is a lot of times that's what you do. You just say, how do I start coding plugins right, yeah. for Minecraft? And you get two or three tutorials. You summarize it. Now, you know, it's this particular language. That's your one blog post. And then the second blog post, you say, I don't know how to get started. <laughs> I need this piece of software, or this piece of software, and you talk about how you download it. And eventually from coding project to coding project, the, the gaming world was left far behind. He, he, uh, he, he became a professional. He started getting cash, little token uh, uh, hey, cash amounts for yeah. bigger projects. And I think one of his first big project was a, a, an owner of a server farm of Minecraft. And uh, the owner was getting frustrated that a lot of people who had been banned for bad behavior were coming in under different IPs and under different uh, um, IDs. And so they needed to write some code that would start uh, um, taking care of this issue. Now he, my son was certainly not advanced enough at that time to be in charge of it but he was advanced enough in a particular area to join a team led by someone very experienced where he started uh, learning how to uh, submit code for revision and approval. And that was his first official big job, which he got a small amount of money for, but from there he got a taste for what it is to bring value to other people. And, and he had to, dis as he went along, he discovered uh, what he really liked. Uh, because, you know, even the programming world is a big world. And uh, right now he, he writes a lot of code for a, a um, particular entrepreneur. He's been doing this for he's 20 years old now, and he just loves it. But that's, that's an example of what we did for one son. He had an interest that as a parent, I'm paying attention. So I want to tell dads, you have instinct that no one else has, because, you know, sometimes for one child, uh, that would break them or it just terrifies them. Whereas another child, right. you know, if they could get a taste at it. So, but I guess my question will, will come back to the, the, the homeschool yeah. and you have, you have a lot of power in the fact that you're homeschooling right. versus a parent who's, you know, who loses their kid for seven, eight hours a day, comes home, they express a passion. Like my, my son loved right. Minecraft too. Uh, we tried things like, uh, uh, Lego techniques to help him to, to try to incentivize him to to code in Linux for yep. uh, for that device. We hoped he would you know use some of his Minecraft skills, but we weren't I, we didn't press it that hard. I certainly didn't suggest writing a blog about any of these things to try to stimulate it. But how would you have, how would you recommend for somebody well, who's not homeschooled? Yeah, well, I would okay. What we did uh, my, for my firstborn who's twenty four, what the, he'd almost be like the the best example because it was it, all the things fell into place and not everything has to fall into place exactly. Right. So you have, this is one of the reasons why to start son. you can make mistakes, right? I mean, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So what our son was interested in, he was interested in uh, digital photography at the time. This is more than 10 years ago. Uh, digital photography was really coming into its own. That's at the beginning of the social media. So everything was becoming affordable. I just remember back then uh, my wife and I have a, have a, um, a home business not related to parent their passion and one of the things of course a lot of times you need to take product shots and we had a clunky digital camera i mean now i mean it's hard to even believe how much it's, yeah, it's yeah. grown <laughs> and the lighting and everything and so um he I, I forget if he i think he got a camera from an aunt you know hand me down so he's taking pictures and of course he was just beginning to discover the the video stuff 
did the typical teen thing. He had his siblings pretend to be run over by a car, uh, <laughs> exploding stuff. Totally fine. But my my dad had went on and I said, that's great that you're having fun with this. But I want to see if there's a way you can bring value. This is the key. How can you bring value to other people with your with your camera? And of course, the immediate answer for a 13 to 12 year old is, how about you help your mom with some product shots? Right. And one of the, and, and then you reverse engineer that. How could you help us with the product shots? And we pay him, by the way, just a small amount. And and he said, well, our biggest issue is the lighting. It always looks, you know, there's there's too much light. It's too washed out, or there's too much. We got simple. So he so he said. So on his own, he said, I'm going to go to the camera shop and talk to the camera guy and see if I can get a couple of lights. While he was there, the guy found out what he was trying to do, and he gave him a lesson right on the spot. Well, he came home with this thing immediately and made a difference for us. So he got from us the emotional attaboy. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't just me telling him, hey, you've got a talent or an eye. He heard the relief of and sigh out of his mom saying, finally, we've got some products that don't look, hor- you know, product shots that don't look horrible. Right. And then from there, I said, you need to make more money. So I want to see you bring more value to other people. So we had a, another friend who, again, uh, um, so he's more technology oriented. He had one of the first uh, small drones that were really more toys at that point in time. And he, he found out he could have fun strapping this camera <laughs> To we saw the original video uh, to the to the drone. They really didn't have the mass produced uh, cameras with gimbals yeah. at that time, yeah. and so it was vibrating. And I said, "Well, how could you how can you bring value now that you've had fun flying all over the place and scaring people? How can you bring value?" We found out the the house next door was going to go for for rent. I said, "Why don't you ask them if you could do an aerial uh, uh, footage for them?" And I think what he maybe got ten dollars. All of a sudden, he's like, well, I could repeat this. Mm-hmm. And from there, he went on to abandoning rentals because they didn't pay that much. And he's getting better and better and better. And it kept morphing and switching. Um, he talked to people. So that's what we did. So you don't have to use your curriculum in that particular case, though we, we certainly hijacked this curriculum. But in that case, it's like um, we encouraged him to one of his first big marketing breaks is that he was doing this so often that at that time it was novel. People would say, oh, would you come and show us how it's used and so forth? So he thought to ask the local real estate agency, could I come and do a presentation on your Monday morning? And if you've ever been in the corporate world, everybody's always bored with these meetings, but you have to have them. And they always like a little entertainment. So they said, why don't you come and show us how you do that? And he did. And he got tons of jobs from them because people and he wasn't expensive. So he started learning the 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 public speaking organically because he wanted to promote his product. So, right. He wasn't he wasn't thinking, oh, I want to become a public speaker. He was thinking, I want people to, to right. see what a great job. Right. So this opened up the door to public speaking now. And I won't mention the name of the company he's working for, but uh, he manages uh, he's 24. He manages men my age, lots of them. And uh, he, he does uh, uh, managerial reports because he's been in the field from down in the trenches all the way to the top. And that was that's an example of how, as a parent, if you start young enough and you pay attention, so this is, this is why it's so important as a dad, the other people around you have some insight into your child, but none like you do. And so once you know you can see this in your child. This is when you can tell your child, this particular interest is just a casual interest and might burn out unless we do something about it. I can also see that if we were to cultivate this, there's a very high likelihood that this, if we add a skill here and a skill there and an opportunity there, and especially if they're older teens, I tell them, if this is going to bring value to the world, let's see if we can start bringing make some money off of this and it doesn't it's not to support them they have see right they have the luxury to discover so if your child you think oh my child's going to become a musician or whatever it is you want especially in the arts it's a little dicey because people have sometimes fantasy ideas because it's you know it's on tv and and the show so people magnify it well i say okay well maybe if that's the case and you seem to have a bent and an interest can you make ten dollars this weekend off of your money 
Your grandma doesn't count. Your mom and dad don't count, right? They love you. And teens know that. That's why they don't react to, uh, I mean, they do. They, they enjoy the, 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 the compliments of their parents, but they're always a little suspicious because, you know, you're half yeah, they're not stupid. They know it's a little weird. When they get $10, their first $10 or whatever it is from someone who doesn't owe it to them, oh my goodness, this light switch comes on. So I, you, you say something that's really important here that I, that uh, you've used this phrase a bunch of times about bringing value to other people. And I, and I, and um, I guess, I guess it, for me, it takes a little bit of a leap of faith to believe that that's the secret sauce. I, I I'm thinking I'm, I'm reacting to a lot of what you're saying and, and trying yeah, to yeah. understand because yeah, I, I thought I was a pretty present father. I was always trying to identify their passions. Yeah. I was always trying to support them and all these things, but maybe, maybe part of what you're saying is, that, that is the secret sauce about how do you bring value? And it's not, how do you bring intrinsic value, but it's, and I don't know if this works for all children, but this idea of maybe it's monetary value and other types of value, but how can you do something that is externally focused, that is right. validating, that creates a loop of- Very well said. That not, external focus is yeah. critical. Yeah, It's critical because- it's hard to evaluate. And I, and I, you know, I think that this is what happens with a lot of teenagers, especially sometimes that they have feelings of, you know, they have, they have, they, they feel inadequate or um, feelings of self-worth is because they, they, they have, even when people compliment them, they're not sure. Right. So, and you see this and there, because the they're participation doubting. trophies are, you know, everywhere. So yeah. And you, you don't know, are people, they, they, are people, you know, people say, Oh, this is a great painting. And you're, you're looking at it and you think that, that this yeah, is really I, I'm a kid and I know this is, and they're telling me this is great. I mean, I this is not good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're you're not sure. So what you need is some kind of a, uh, objective, in a way, objective way for people to tell you you did a good job, uh, essentially. But you but you don't. What I want to bring here home here is that as a father, I don't know what it is that this is going to grow into. So let me give you a fictional example, which is not what we did, but this is an example because I, 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 I artificially constructed a, a situation, which I think perfectly illustrates this. Let, let's say you, you, your family, your family's uh, way to wind down and their identity is to go to football games. And I like to pick the people, uh, pick on people in the South, which I'm not from. I don't get it. I hear about it. I have friends who are in it. The famous football Texas. is everything. I'm like, oh, whatever. Okay. But I, I understand the, the, the social component of it. You've been working all week. You want to see your friends. You, yeah. you want to have some good beer and food and you just want to relax. And the game is kind of an excuse to shout and, you know, be outdoors. <laughs> yeah. I get that part. Okay. So typically the way it's set up, let's say you have a daughter who's very artistic. So typically in people's minds, it's like you have two ships passing in the night, right? The, 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 the proverbial artistic daughter who has to find herself because her identity is not the same as her, 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 her dad and her uncle's uh, football loving beer drinking situation. I'm just like, no, this is a completely wrong way to say it. So either you force the dad to spend his Saturdays taking him to a studio, right? So he he's he's suffering for his daughter's art. And typically, by the way, if you have lots of kids, you can only do this with one or two kids. And the <laughs> other kids write the memoir later on about how <laughs> yeah. their their sibling got to be the opera singer and they got you know got yeah, squat. Yeah. You know, that's not what you want to do. You say, okay, my daughter is artistic, and and um, one of the issues we ran into early on is she got into the realistic art. Which and and she was doing great, but nobody wanted realistic realistic art because digital photography is so good, and even the ones who did want it uh, just can't afford it. But you know what they did want, and we found this out by because people said, "I want you to draw pictures. Of, uh, I want you to draw cartoon caricatures of my grandkids and or my pets." It's a hot little sub market, right? Because they could take pictures. But what they wanted is someone to capture the, the essence of whatever they felt the grandchild. There was a market for this. This is a very small child's market or teen market. In the example of the, the, the football loving, uh, decompressing, they've worked hard too, right? They deserve a downtime. How can an artistic child bring value to the family's identity? I'd say, well, hey, that's, that's kind of easy. You can go in a million different directions with art. And one of the problems that teens have is they can't focus. They're here, they're there, but they're never focused enough to make 
uh, uh, to make enough progress. So I said, well, there's a form of art that's called, I think, speed art, which is basically uh, capturing live, live events. And you see this allowed a bit in street sketching, which is kind of a derivation of it. She could specialize in this. So every time she's going to, uh, to the football game, now's an opportunity for her to either uh, draw the people around her, capture the moment, or capture the people on the field. I can guarantee you she's going to become the hero of all the people. Everybody's going to want a, a copy of the caricatures or the speed. Maybe you get to give... Uh, uh, you get lucky enough where you start giving your 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 speed drawings to the players themselves. Before you know it, your dad is going to you know dad's going to make sure his daughter's coming along because he's making him look good. Now you're not cloning her interest to become a football lover, but you're using your family's identity, your family's resources to give an opportunity for your child to bring value. So you need your family to open those doors for you. You're not good enough yet. Is, right. Maybe at 19 or 20, you can do that. Do you, you choose what that is for your child or suggest it? I mean, what if she says, I, yeah, yeah, I don't, I'm not interested. Yeah. Like, well, well, like they do, I, you know? I, well, my answer is, well, I'm not driving you on a Saturday morning to sit in the studio because I did that once. Yeah. <laughs> my daughter actually complained about it. And I'm like, oh, great. So here I am suffering for my uh, <laughs> my child's art and they didn't really care. Uh, it was too passive for them. But my point is, yes, because we're willing to do this for our child's normal traditional education, mm -hmm. right? We're not willing to say, hey, you don't have to do your algebra uh, this month. He said, well, I don't have a natural bent towards algebra. Well, like, too bad. Right. You're going to graduate, right? There's a minimum amount. I mean, obviously, we don't necessarily push into calculus or, you know, if they really have difficulty. But my point is there are natural expectations because we say this is important to your future. We, we interpret that to be important. And we try to sweet talk it. We say, hey, if you finish it tonight or you get a C or a B or you raise it from a B to an A, I'll buy you whatever. You can do that with your, your talent. And that's what I will do also. I, I will say, you know what? I know art is important to you. I know you want to get better, but we need to find a way uh, 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 for you to uh, bring value to people. Let's give it, so so a lot of times I'll say, well, then go look online to find a first course on how to, we'll, we'll use a, online courses or anything to kind of jumpstart that. So let, let me give you an example of real life for, for my daughter. Sure. Um, she She's very artistic and has a many other talents. She's a wonderful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Obviously. I know we um, see the potential, right? We see the potential. She, she self-taught her, she self-taught herself uh, calligraphy and she does this beautiful calligraphy. You know, she spent literally hours, I don't know, yeah. while she was listening to music, whatever, perfecting all those letters and everything. Right. You know, got it. Be, you know, beautifully done. So she had this talent. And so in your vein, I would, I said, Hey, you know, you could make money off of that. You could do wedding invitations. All you have to do is put a ad on Craigslist. I'm sure you could earn a yep. dollar, $5, $10 of invitation. And I, I don't know if it was because the way I presented it or whatever, but it wasn't something that sparked interest in her. And I would think that that would fit exactly into your model of here's a way to get a, external validation for your art um, but it wasn't motivating. So uh, what, what do you do in those? Well, cases well where... because, and I totally understand. It's not that we didn't wrestle with that, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. So what I see is it's a discovery, a joint discovery process. Like, so let's say in the, in the case of, you know, wedding invitation, like when you brought that up, do you remember how old she was at that time? No, she was probably 16, 17. Okay. I mean, which is pretty normal. I mean, a lot, especially girls, especially artistic kind that they're, they're sometimes overly critical of themselves. I don't know if that's the case of your child, but almost every artistic person that would describe themselves as artistic, sometimes they're really hard on themselves. And part of it is because what they do is a lot of times, I think it's a, a reflection of their own identity, right? So it's one of those uh, uh, mediums that people are involved in that they feel is a reflection on themselves more than, let's say, if you're adding up numbers and doing math. I, I think there's a certain amount of uh, psychological distance. Well, subjective or subjective. Yeah. So a lot of it has to do with they don't, their confidence level is low. So just the thought of saying, I'm going to put myself out there. Now I'm assuming this. So my whole point is, I don't know what it is. I'm going to have that conversation. My next thing is say, well, I think it's a great, I might, I'll say that. I think it's a great idea, but maybe, maybe it isn't. So what could we do to use your, your, uh, is there something you'd love to be able to do for other people with your calligraphy? 
and have this conversation. They probably don't know. I find that from experience, my kids don't really know yeah, what they know. want yet. I see the potential, right? I'm the dad. I see this potential. Now you can't do everything. So there, there is a certain amount of realism, but I'm saying, let's look for an opportunity to bring, um, uh, in, especially if they're younger, I might, instead of value, I might, I might use the word joy to someone else, right? Let's see how we, how can we bring some joy to someone else? So it might be more uh, a simple um, where uh, maybe a close relative or a close friend that she may know uh, need some encouragement and some cheer and she, you know, and maybe you could write a poem. So maybe she doesn't, maybe she's too sensitive to write something personal, but maybe you could, and you say, I want to, I want to, and I've done this. I'll say, I want to write a letter to someone encouraging them. And uh, I might have my daughter say, Hey, could you draw a picture for so-and-so uh, and I'm going to include it in there. So I might do that in order to, to see if this can spark uh, 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 this interest. And so if you get positive feedback or if, or if, a, if the, 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 your, your teenager starts realizing, you know what, I can do this. Maybe I don't want to write. You don't know what it is. Maybe they want, maybe they'll suggest something you never thought of. I mean, there could be, it, it could be, it could be, and I, I don't know. It could be that she may, maybe she, she, uh, she might be more comfortable working uh, as part of a team, let's say doing some kind of YouTube video where they want calligraphy to come on the screen, right? It's a very uh, niche area, but a lot of sometimes you, you, some people work better in teams because they feel, you know, um, psychologically buffered by the, uh, they're not on the spot. It's just part of a larger thing. So I think the answer to that is to have a longer drawn out conversation. Uh, one, telling them that you understand that they are good at that. They seem to have a bent. It's like, how could we use that? So you're able to continue. I think it's so that you're able to continue uh, pursuing this craft, whatever it is. And I think that's the beginning of the conversation, uh, uh, this idea of continuity. So you, you have an interest. Uh, we, we, we understand in the sports world because it's, it's so blown up in my mind, it's almost too much, but like if you want to play football in high school and you're at a big high school and yeah, they play they, football, typically conversation, like if you want to continue playing, fill in the blank. What do they say? You're going to have to join the summer camp, right? You're going to have to do this, right? You know, you know the answer, right? right? But when a child has, a, has, has a, as a, a bent or an interest that's not necessarily on a mass scale, which actually is an advantage, by the way, because then you have an opportunity to shine, then there are things you're going to have to do in order to go to the next level. What that next level is, is part of the conversation. I do not know necessarily. So probably if your daughter, if I was talking to your daughter and, and we were having this conversation and sometimes I'll do this with teens, I'll, I'll kind of, I'm not their parent, so I'm not going to go that far, but I'll kind of say, like, okay, what do you like about do, doing about this? And they may, as they're telling you why they are doing this, they may tell you, it may reveal something about what is driving them uh, uh, to be so focused on this craft. And once you understand that, you may find that it's maybe not necessarily the obvious part of the craft, um, uh, but the craft is a vehicle uh, to communicate something or do something, right? So you, 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 well, the, sometimes yeah, when people it, cook, they want to bring comfort to people. It's not right. so much necessarily that they like to cook, which it might be, but it might be a vehicle for them to be able to Give comfort it. someone. So that's what I'm trying to get at. So those conversations are key to helping you. Yeah. I think there's a big the challenge. You know, I, I, I work as a coach. And uh, so a lot of those conversations are a lot more baked into coaching, but uh, as we all know, uh, Coaching your kids is not uh, the same as no. parenting your kids. And, is not, not, not that easy to do. So I, I I take your point that I think like a lot of stuff in parenting, there's a lot more um, a lot more work that you need to do. It's not like uh, why don't you do this with your calligraphy? No. And then they say yes, you that's a great idea, it. Dad. No. I'm running with it, and I'll, I'll go. It may be it may be a conversation that takes a lot longer to germinate than that. Uh, well, that, in fact, I think that's one of the things, uh, and I hope. I hope your listeners will get a chance to go to my website, Parent Their Passion, put their email in, and they'll right away have access to a worksheet. And one of the things I, and you, it'll become very clear is I have you go through writing down the list of interests that your child has. Anything from Minecraft to uh, reading submarine books to 
loving their pet turtles, right? So you're okay. thinking, well, I'm not saying any of those are going to become a talent, right? So I just say, it's like, you know what? Guess what? The reality is that none of these interests are actually a talent. In fact, they'll probably die and come to nothing. And that's okay in itself. Interest by itself at that age is not powerful enough to, to sustain a, a focused interest. So what you have to do is, you know, to use a popular term in the adult world, you have to stack on top of that a tool or resource that belongs to your family and then stack on top of that a family activity. So your child is, uh, just in the example of the daughter doing speed art at a football game, her art by herself, she can barely get the neighbor uh, uh, to watch her drawing, right? She, she's going to, you know, typical teenage girl to go to go to deviant art. And there's a million photos of girls crying because their emotions that are high, high tide. And, uh, you know, as a dad, you're like, okay, great. I get the point, you know, girls feeling down and, you know, how many pictures can you, who wants to buy that? You know, <laughs> uh, te- you know, technical art is there, but it's not serving anybody. And this is where the difficulty is. So if you can find a way to serve people, then your, 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 um, your younger, your young person has to wrestle with what does it mean to bring value? So let's say she, the first day she goes out there at the football game, she's totally not interested in football. That's besides the point. Now she can sketch the guy eating the, you know, uh, spilling the beer on himself and, and the hot dog. And, and she does it. She doesn't quite get the feedback she wants. People say, oh, it's nice. And then people go on. Another time she does it and she captures, I don't know, she, she captures the moment uh, a caricature of the kid catching the ball and people go, Oh, this is fantastic. And everybody wants a copy of it. So she goes, aha, what people want is they want to capture this particular moment, right? Or it may be something completely different. Um, that's that discovery process because this is the beginning of owning your talent. So you, as a lot of times my kid, when they get to a certain level, my 13 year old is already at that level. He'll come and tell me something about some kind of firmware update issue, blah, blah, blah. And I'll smile. I do lots of smiling. And I say, you know what? I don't really understand it all because it's already way above my pay grade. But I love that you are wrestling with it. And he'll, he'll come back frustrated. It's like, dad, they didn't do this and they didn't do that. It's like, I'll tell him right about it. And I love telling my kids when they're, when they're so advanced that I can't understand what they're really talking about because the technical stuff is too advanced. I am happy because they're taking ownership They're They'll stay. I have yeah, to, one not. of my biggest problems is I have to go in and turn off the light at night. It's like, okay, kids, it's time to power down oh. on whatever it is that they're doing. So in the case of the art example, that feedback she's going to get is going to tell her what direction to go. It has nothing to do with football. Football is the excuse. But your family is opening those doors for you. They're opening the emotional gateways. This is why people buy art, right? This is why they're, they're, when you get down to it, why are you doing art? Why are you doing music? Well, you could say, well, at the end of it, it's because I want to move people. Well, the yeah. bottom question is, are you moving people? Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. Let's reverse engineer this. Yeah. Well, you can't argue with the fact that you've got you've got a sample set of nine. <laughs> you're, you're, you've, been, you've been very successful with this. I, I I think it's a it's I think this idea of value and trying to externally validate is really is very strong. I need to uh, need to try to practice. Well, you know what? We need it as dads too, though. Yeah, yeah. Because I I don't know. Sometimes I'm like, what the heck are we doing here? Is this like are we going too far? You know, we we had to pull the plug one time on uh, on <laughs> one daughter. She's married now and everything's doing great. But she was like persuaded she wanted to become a horse trainer. So she, these are expensive lessons and she was getting good at it, but she was at some point, she was basically refusing, you know, all these opportunities were coming up. And, and in that particular world, you have to be up at five in the morning, et cetera, et cetera. And you have to be, you have to stay on top of it. And she just was not doing the work, but I was the one driving her. And I, I was like, I, so we had, we had a very painful, it did not, it was not a happy moment. I was like, I can't, we can't keep paying for this. Uh, I can't come get up, up in the world. You're not willing to do this. And she, she had a choice uh, uh, with pursuing her art or the horse training. And then she was going to try to talk me in to dad, we could flip horses, which basically means you get a horse. And I'm like, I'm not a farmer. <laughs> So we had some, we had some heated discussions and I'm like, you're getting too old for this now. If, if you want to go, you know, you want to, you know, you know, take it to the next level, you're going to have to bring in some money. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and there's plenty of people who want to buy horses that are already trained, you know, for their child because it takes time to train it. Yeah. She was not willing at that time. Uh, uh, now that she's an adult, she's deciding she wants to get back into it. And that's fine. But as, as a dad, I'm just like, this is not going anywhere. In fact, I was fueling um, um, her hobby was turning inward. Okay, because it, it's inward and it creates frustration. There's an internal dynamic that is not good uh, for probably for adults too, where you're really good at something, but you have no way of bringing it to market. It's very frustrating. Yeah. So we, I cut it off, not because I was against horses, but because it was draining our family. And I'm saying, this is not realistic. You're not willing to put in the work to go to the next level. And that's what it takes. She's telling me this, but she's not getting up. Yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of so, fathers, a lot yeah. of parents hit that. That's what it gets more. Yeah, you do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has really been very, very interesting. I, I, I'll be interested to follow follow uh, your your uh, your website and and check out this uh, this downloadable worksheet at uh, parenttheirpassion.com, which should give you some give give you some uh, guidance on how to begin this uh, thinking like this. And you say this this works best for kids over the age of twelve, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, because uh, prior to that age, and, and I've, by the way, and I have experimented <laughs> with doing this younger, but I found that there's so much hand holding that at the end of the yeah. day, you're, you, when they start, you don't, they don't, you're, you're spending too much time They're not holding, holding, holding their hand and they don't take enough ownership. They're waiting for you emotionally to drive them. Yeah, sure, sure. And, and that's fine. At that point, just be, enjoy the nurture stage, to be honest, because when you tell them you did a good job or you, you did a great presentation. They are happy. They truly are happy. But when they start becoming teens, that's not enough. Not anymore, yeah. And so, you know, you harness that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Jonathan Harris, and along with his wife, Renee Harris, has, has have the website, uh, parenttheirpassions.com. And you can check that out. I'm Paul Vance with greatdad.com. You can check out my, uh, my coaching, especially my new uh, workshop on positive intelligence at greatdad.com slash PQ. And until next time, have a great day. Bye.